great lakes, mile probably exciting all day. So we agree. Um, and then we have other research stations that cover the other great one in Charlevoix, one in Alcina, one in Marquette, and then we have uh say people fishers research in Ann Arbor and they do a lot of uh, inland stuff. Uh, so um Today I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we've been using acoustic telemetry to study fish movement. Um, and I'm going to give you a little bit of background about like, you know, what is acoustic telemetry, what is the system called GLADOS that is in the, the title that we use to um, collect this data, and then a, a little bit of a, um, a walkthrough on the project that I'm doing right now on, on muskies. Uh, so here's how I probably should have heads up just now, but that, that's what I'm going to talk about, like I just said. Uh, this is our this is our research vessel, the channel cat, um, that we used to do most of our Great Lakes surveys. So uh, she just turned 50 years old last year. So uh, we had a big birthday party. Uh, so it's just a pretty cool, uh, pretty pretty cool boat that uh, our the crew that we has done a really nice job of modifying for our, our purposes uh, on the Great Lakes. So uh, what is acoustic telemetry? And this is a sort of uh, my words and not anything that maybe you would find in a textbook or, or other source, but basically, so for my purposes, it's a method for detecting movement and environmental data on um, fish. So you find some way, and it, it, it could be done in animals. Um, acoustic telemetry basically means that you have a tag that you put on or in the fish that makes a sound, and then you can detect that sound. Um, that sound usually encodes information that receivers can pick up. Um, so there, you, know, you can have two different types of, of tracking. One, you put this tag in an animal, you can actively track it, and you're going out looking, listening to try to find it. Or you can have passive tracking, which is what I'm going to focus on today. And passive tracking just means you put out something that can listen for those tags, and, and you leave it and come back later to pick it up. So you can get a lot of uh, information from these tags. Most of it's you know, pretty basic at the starting point, but it's the integration of this uh, data with other data like habitat or environment um, or a season that's in history. So you definitely can get position depending on where the station was that heard the, the tag, you know that that fish was pretty close to that station. The uh, range varies greatly. So on a quiet day, you know, the environment's noisy. If you've got boat traffic or if you've got wave traffic, that's noise that interferes with those tags being detected. But on a quiet day, you can probably detect tags up to a kilometer or perhaps more away from um, the site. On a more noisy environment, that you know that detection range drops off. So that's one of the challenges we have to do. Um, so this is this is an acoustic receiver. And this is what listens for the tags. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about these, but these are what I put down on the lake to, to hear my tags. Um, this is. A dummy tag, of a, but about the size of one of the really large tags that we put in big fish like musky or sturgeon. Um, so this is one I made to kind of track it with. You have to track it putting these on. So uh, this kind of simulates the rough size and, and shape of what a real tag would be. Um, and then depending on the programming, so you can program these tags to make their sound at a certain set interval and you can um, you know, adjust that interval. To, to, Less frequently, the tag pings the longer it lasts. But these have a battery life of up to about seven or eight years, depending on how we program. This is a, a dummy tag. It's clear. Sorry, I didn't I didn't color these ones. Uh, but this is a dummy tag of a smaller tag. This is something that I practiced putting in yellow perch. Um, and this tag will probably have a battery life of about a year right now. Yeah. So what happens when something eats that perch and then it's going to ping somewhere else? Yep. Yeah, that, that would be uh, an anomaly in the data. There are tags that can detect them, the, the fish that they eat them. So they have uh, like a coating, type of coating that can be digested by a, an enzyme that it'll emit a different signal that I can know that it's not. Oh. But that's not the tags that I have. Those two are a little bit more expensive. Um, and I actually haven't found any first tagging yet. This is just sort of the first step in, in launching that kind of program. Does it have a mortality thing like the collars do? Or? Some of them can, but um, and again, that's sort of a different type of enzyme when it's in, it goes to a different, or a, I'm sorry, different coating. But these tags don't do that. So the, this tag, if you know, if the fish died, it would ping on the bottom for seven years, uh, and that you know that can cause problems depending on the, the location. Uh, and all of these tags that I use are just the basic. Where are you? But you can get more advanced tags to tell you the temperature, so that might tell you sort of. 
the type of environment that the fish is in. It might tell you um, the, the pressure, the, bare, uh, the pressure of the water, so that will give you a sense of how deep the fish is. Um, there's a lot more information you can get on the, on the bag with some really extra money for the, the access to the result. So um, basically, the, the process is that we catch a fish. So this is us uh, electrocuting uh, in the Thames River in Ontario. And, uh, it was an exciting day because the water was like chocolate milk. <laughs> and I'm all the, the fish were often not visible until they were like leaping at you like that. So what this boat does is it puts an electric current into the water that stuns or irritates the fish. It initially draws them towards them, and at some point the electricity um, you know overcomes their senses and they're they're stunned. But sometimes we don't know how to choose it. I don't think we were able to net based on taste position, I don't think we could get it. And that even fish, but it, it could be a, a challenge and uh, but it's a really good way of collecting fish in a you know, more or less harmless way. There, um, we've got a lot of experience in getting our electrical settings just right so that we stop the fish without harming them. And I've never seen, I've actually never seen a more jolly from electrician than from fish. Um, so then the next thing is to get the tag implanted. So in our, our process, we surgically implant these tags. So um, this fish has been knocked out again using electricity, so we stunned it with electricity. So it's unconscious. Um, this right here is its life support system, so we've got fresh water pumping in over its gills to keep it um, breathing. Um, we make a quick incision, insert the bag, uh, sew it up with a couple of sutures, and then typically we hold the fish for half hour, hour to make sure that it's upright, that it's recovered from that, and then you release the fish and we hope to secure those bags. This process takes about two minutes. We're really quick, and you can see here that this beautiful clean <laughs> not hitting anything, uh, anything vital. So, uh, real quick, and, and the fish recovered really well. Uh, uh, as well. And after that, the fish is out in the environment, and you're hoping to detect it again. Trying to get detected by these by these stations. Uh, so, the type of data you might get is something that might look like this. So, you have a release location. Here, this is the approximate location of the Thames River um, in Lake St. Clair. And then these you are know, sort of made up data points, so you don't have to, you can't, shouldn't be inferring patterns here if you're trying to go out and target the musky, but then you have fish from up here in October and then work his way into the Detroit River in, in March and May. Um, and, you know, using this, you can infer movement. We assume that if it went from here to here, it, it moved there. Um, and you can infer behavior. So that's sort of one of the things that has to be kept in mind with acoustic telemetry is you're not seeing these fish. So, if a fish goes into a spawning area at a spawning time of year, the assumption is that it's there to spawn, but we don't know that for sure. It just makes sense based on um, the movement that we collect. So, the types of questions that we uh, typically use these methods to answer are uh, where and when are animals spending time? Um, are there distinct groups of animals in my area? So, Lake St. Clair is a big lake. Are there groups of muskies that don't interact with each other just because they stay separate? They use different parts of the lake. Um, and that can be really important if you want to get a population estimate of the muskies in Lake St. Clair, knowing that where those invisible boundaries might be can really inform your, your estimate of the, the total population. Um, you can ask questions about whether different types of animals, so males and females, or adults and young, are, are behaving similarly or differently, are they utilizing different habitat? Is it important to protect certain types of habitat to make sure that the, there's a place for the young uh, muskies to grow and, and reach adult size? And likewise, are there important spawning areas that we're not aware of that we should protect to make sure that there aren't changes there that would reduce spawning in the future? <clears throat> and the other thing that we're really looking for are repeatable patterns. Um, so things that happen year after year in the same place. Um, and that's why tags that last seven years are really, really valuable for us. We can get a whole lot of data from individuals over time. So are there any, any questions on, on that aspect? Yeah. Are these sounds specific, or like on a on a collar, there would be a frequency, so you could tell specific animals. Right. Can so you tell specific fish on this? Yep, or? they're coded. So the ping sequence of the tag is coded to a number, and that's how you can tell an individual mm -hmm. animal. Yep. So they are unique to that animal. How many of these receivers do you have to drop into lake in order to get all they receive up the kilometer? Quite a few, and that's where GLaDOS really comes in. So GLaDOS, uh, uh, before, I, before I go further, are there any other questions about the one? Yeah. I was wondering how many of those on receivers you need in order to get enough information to calculate. 
me a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Right. So like it, it well, depends on it depends on your system and the type of questions you're trying to ask. Yeah. <laughs> I I maintain six. So to put that up, but I'll put that into context here shortly. So Lados um, is the Great Lakes Acoustic Telemetry Observation System, and it's basically a network of projects which I I'm not actually affiliated. So I'm kind of a I'm, now that I have, now that I own some of these myself, I'm less of a freeloader than I was before. But essentially, <laughs> the vast majority of these that are out there in the environment, I don't own and maintain. So, because it's a common equipment, these you know receivers, whoever owns them, can detect my fish. And likewise, the receivers that I do own detect other people's fish. So, Gladys is a way for sharing that information and really expanding the reach of any single telemetry study. Um, you know, it's it's a really cool, I think, fairly unique partnership of, of you know, different scientific projects that are working together um, that, that all mutually benefit. <coughs> so that is the GLaDOS network. All of those dots are one of those that are located in the lake. Um, GLaDOS is uh, sort of a center in Lake Erie, which is now uh, gridded, which is I mean, just tremendous movement data. Um, when you have a grid like that, I think that's a, I, think, I want to say 10 kilometer grid, but I could be wrong on that. But incredible coverage, really good coverage through here, Lake St. Clair, Detroit River, Lake, uh, St. Clair River. And then there are other projects that, um, there are other projects throughout the Great Lakes that use this system to a, to a different extent. And this system is constantly changing. So the network configuration is, is changing as and projects start and stop and, and receivers are picked up and, and moved around. So this is a screenshot from uh, probably last year at some point. So the network probably doesn't look like this anymore, which um, is the challenge. Do you know if they take um, the Asian carp? Uh, I think they have some carps down there, Ted. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, grass, grass carp, I think they have. Grass carp or Ted in the theory, yep. Yeah. Um, most likely. Mm -hmm. I, but I think right now it's a lot of uh, sentinel species that they're using down there. I'm not sure that they have actual Asian carp tag or if they're using other like common carp surrogate type of species. Yeah. Uh, How do you get the information off the receiver? Send it to you or do you have to pull them out and download them? Uh, unfortunately, no. All of these have to be physically recovered from the lake bottom. You put a dongle in there that has Bluetooth that communicates with your computer. So it has to be. You know, within the Bluetooth range of your computer to um, download the data. And that's why a project where we, you know, a system or a network where we're all cooperating through a massive amount of labor distributed through a whole bunch of different projects is really, really important. Because, like I mentioned, I own six of these, and that's about all I can handle, um, you know, in terms of my other work to maintain a given region. So, basically, like I kind of said, the network of projects is common equipment. I recover the individual receivers. Um, I do not upload that to the Gladys database. And so that receiver has all of my fish's detections, but also hundreds, if not thousands, of detections of other people's fish um, that I upload to Gladys. And then um, you kind of download your own individual fish back, um, get that from everywhere else in, in the network. So just kind of this further. Uh, discussion the red receivers here are the ones I own and maintain. Um, these blue receivers are ones that uh, partners with ours in Ontario own and maintain, so that's also part of the Muskie project, um, but that I don't maintain. So between us, the red and the blue are all we would have, all the information we could get without the cooperation of the lab center. So it, it really is a um, fabulous uh, uh, cooperation. And then again, here's the Great Lakes, you know, I have access to all these. So previously, the limitation to any telemetry study is that you can only find your animal where you look for it, right? If you didn't have something there, you couldn't detect it. So um, there'd be no way to know about, you know, maybe rare or, you know, extraordinary movements because you weren't expecting them, you weren't looking there. Now with that, we have this large system-wide um, network of, of receivers and, and some of these rarer or more extraordinary movements can be detected, which is it's really cool and, and shedding some um, really unique insights, at least for my project, which I'll, I'll share with you shortly here. Um, so, this 
So just by the numbers I mentioned, that it's a network of projects. Uh, this I pulled, I think, from their website. So this is probably also out of date, but just to give you a sense, there's over 60 individual projects that are occurring throughout the Great Lakes. Uh, there's been more than 40 species of fish tagged. So the majority of fish that have been tagged are uh, walleye. There's been a lot of lake surgeon tagged. Um, there's been a fair number of musky studies, uh, a couple of other uh, in different areas that had tagged fish. Um, Burbot had been tagged in the St. Clair River. Um, uh, and then some you know, individual uh, smaller numbers of other species as well. Um, there's 2,700 receivers in that network, and there's been over 200 million data points collected. So this really is big data. You know, if you can't open these files in Excel, you've got you to do um, a lot of post processing that's, uh, that's very complicated. And you also have to decide you know, at what point is the detection or are two different detections independent events, right? So fish might stay at a receiver for an hour and you might get 100 detections in that time and you have to kind of filter that through, um, you know, for uh, <coughs> So are there are questions about that aspect. Um, Mark receivers, so you say you have to go down and get them. Yep. Do they themselves send a signal so you know where it is or do you have to like GPS when you drop it down there? Do you have a buoy or? So I GPS them. So what I do is I put I have this uh, uh, I have a PVC pipe that fits this that's embedded in an 80 pound concrete anchor, and then I run a steel cable from that concrete anchor to another anchor. And so then what we do is we drive our boat in between those two points with a hook and, and hope to snag that snag line. And then pull it. High tech. Very high tech. Yeah. So I mean the GPS is it's better. Hopefully you have a good fix on. On that day, and then I have about a 50 foot cable, so you got a little bit of leeway in between those, those two points. So, yeah. How often do you retrieve the download information? The battery lasts about 15 months, and I've still failed utterly to, to line up that 15 month window with like a nice time of year. <laughs> March and November is usually when I'm out there trying to trying to get that. Cool. Uh, I just pulled this one up in March, and it's still it's still listening. You can see the light flashing. So I've been leaving these with their old batteries in just to see if maybe uh, see how many extra months maybe you can squeeze out of that battery. Though obviously at room temperature, the battery's going to drain differently than it would if it was at the bottom of the, the lake at four degrees Celsius right now. But um, just give me a sense of that. But I, I typically do 15 month retrievals because I don't want to. I don't want to risk having it die in the bottom and, and miss uh, miss the, the window. Of, of, yeah. As far as the tanks go and the recovery of fish, is there anything you can do with that external so, adaption? I put an external tag on the fish. Um, if someone catches it and plans to harvest it, I was told they'll call me and I try to communicate that uh, information with, with anglers. Um, I haven't gotten any, I've gotten reports of fish that have caught and released, but I've never gotten um, a tag back. No, but uh, with walleye that are you know really commonly harvested, we, they, they do get their bag back. Um, and uh, they offer a reward, and I don't, so maybe that's part of it. They have a lot more fish bags, a lot more common parts. Yeah. How expensive is it? Receivers and a tag? Uh, these tags are, both sides is actually are about $330. <laughs> um, and the receiver is about $1,400, I would say. So it, telemetry studies like this are expensive and can be done kind of willy-nilly. You have to have a really good reason to, to do one. So it's a, it's, I may have a picture later, but it's a, it's a, we call it a spaghetti tag. So it goes through the muscle at the base of the dorsal fin, and it connects on the outside, so it forms like a loop. It's bright orange, and I think it has my, my phone number and um, a, a, a number as well. Yeah. <laughs> so as far as those tanks, you're pretty much, I don't want to say throw it out, 330 bucks, but you can expect not to get that back. But yeah, you, you, you're, not, you're on like this, get it back, and then maybe it's going to wall out or something like that. Yeah. Do you think people catch and release them because they want more help with you? Let you have the data for where they go more. Uh, well, it varies with fish species. Muskies are already pretty much exclusively released. Uh, we have mandatory 
harvest reporting in Michigan, and I think we've had Twelve or thirteen fish reported harvest in this whole year, so it's it's pretty much a ninety nine twenty nine percent. You know, with walleye though, it's a different story. Walleye are you know, <coughs> most people. Walleye are caught are harvest business, so those fish, um, you know, they might have different. They might have more fish. People are aware of the study trying to help them out. Yeah, and then the Okay, uh, so let me move into the actual uh, musky project that I'm doing a little bit. I'll share some data with you. Um, so, just some background. For those of you who don't know, musky are sort of like the big brothers of northern pike. They're large sausage fishes, they're the largest predator in the Great Lakes. Um, they're a very popular sport fish in Michigan, um, and they can exceed 20 years in age and, and 50 pounds in weight. So, they get, they get pretty big. Um, uh, they're one of our most popular sport fish on the Michigan Square, and we have a very abundant population of fish. Depending on who you talk to, is either a really good thing or a really bad thing. I mean, our predators are the benefit lane for the uh, for for declines and other uh, fish species here in Um So, throughout most of the Great Lakes, there was, uh, or I'm sorry, throughout history, there was strong population. <laughs> we have some really cool vintage photos, like this one is from the St. Clair River in 1900. Pretty good catch of uh, muskies. Um, this uh, photo is from Tommy Folk Library, which is in Detroit, and it's sort of a um, you know woods and back in the day a really popular um, tournament location for muskies. And uh, you can see that this tournament was so back then fish were not mostly released; these were harvest case tournaments, and um, muskies were, were harvested pretty well. And then the majority of Great Lakes water that that you know, really substantial decline in musky abundance. For whatever reason, um, in what we call the St. Clair Detroit River system, so Detroit River, Lake St. Clair, and the St. Clair River, that population always uh, held on and remained strong. So today we still have really excellent musky populations in, um, in Lake St. Clair and the connecting waters as well. So traditionally, our station has studied muskies through sort of three methods. Uh, one, which we call fishery independent in our own surveys, so not based on other folks fishing. Uh, we did trap netting up in Anchor Bay, which is basically a big net that, that fish shot. Uh, we've got a, a cage essentially, and then these long nets that go out in the water. And the fish will hit those nets, and that kind of guides them into the cage, where we have a difficult time getting out until we come to the season. So traditionally, we use trap netting. Um, we also use real surveys and then uh, charter reporting. So when charter captains take the clients out, they would report back to us what they um, bought that day. And that's been our, our three primary methods. Um, unfortunately, crab netting is really no longer effective. So Lake St. Clair with the addition of zebra mussels and quad mussels has become really, really clear. So the fish are able to see the nest and it, it seems that, that that's had a really big effect on our ability to catch muskies in the crab nest. We basically don't get them anymore. Um, and we don't think that's related to the population because you know the other metrics still continue to show strong, really strong population. Drill surveys have been sporadic, so that when we have them, they're really great sources of information, but um, we just haven't had them very often on Lake St. Clair. And then charter reporting doesn't include the whole lake, so the charters are only required to report what they catch in the American waters in Lake St. Clair, but they tend to spend most of their time fishing for musky in the Canadian waters. So. Um, while it is a really good source of data, it, it, it's sort of biased in that way that uh, makes it distinguishing habits that folks to understand. So, if you know, they're catching fewer fish, is it because they spent more time fishing in Canada or is it because there's fewer fish in the, in the system? It can be hard to tell. So, for this specific project, we've been working with a, a large number of product, uh, partners. Uh, it's been a really cool experience for me, but we've been working with our colleagues in Ontario, Ohio. Um, with the USGS, and we've been able to take advantage of that GLaDOS network that I've spoken about. Uh, so, what we're trying to understand are the population boundaries. So, are there distinct groups of muskies in Lake St. Clair that maybe don't interact or interact maybe a little bit? What's the abundance? So, positive or negative? Uh, are there spawning areas that we can locate in the in lake that we don't know about right now? This is really important because the root stock for the stocking of muskies that happen in Michigan are all collected from the Detroit River. So we're dependent on just a very small area for all of our musky eggs. It would be nice from both the genetic and sort of the background, you know, just in case something were to happen, um, to have other sources to collect eggs from. So 
So if you can identify those spawning areas, that might give us um, some more resiliency into our cascade. Uh, and then another interesting, uh, another interesting we have is how these fish will find anglers. So after being caught and released, how long does it take them to sort of resume normal behaviors? Uh, and these are all things that we could potentially use to let the So this here is actually a photo of them collecting eggs uh, on the on the sea from the Detroit River. So what can we reasonably expect to learn? And this is always, I always do this like, I give this talk a lot to angling groups and they think the most important thing that they, well, it's actually on the next slide, but they, they want me to tell them. Um, but what can we reasonably expect is to learn things about differences in male female behavior, differences in size, and then habitat use information <coughs> such as where they spend any time. And then again, hopefully we can learn something about the population boundaries, which will help us estimate this uh, uh, abundance of musky. But what is unreasonable, or what we're not alone getting, is this right here, real-time fish location. <laughs> so anglers think that I can tell them like where a fish is at any given time, and I try to explain like I actually have to go pick those up, and I leave them out for 15 months. So my data is always lagged for like, you know, 15 months or more for my own um, receivers, and I have no control over uh, when anyone else in the GLaDOS network pulls up there. Um, and also, and this is just again a reminder for myself, is it doesn't provide proof of certain behavior. So again, if a fish is in a spawning area at a spawning time of year, it doesn't mean that that fish actually spawned. It just means that that's, it went there. So that's sort of a, a check on my own language and, and uh, just try to keep me honest here. Right? So here's where we've released fish so far. Um, we started down here in the Detroit River in 2016. So we had fish. Um, <coughs> So we start near Belle Isle and down near Wyandotte. We added the Thames River in October of 16, um, and then uh, have had fish release of the Bell River in October of 17 and 18. These have been done by our Canadian partners and um, and working with anglers. So a lot of those fish were caught by anglers and then uh, tagged. And then these all must be. All must be. Yep. And then this spring, I tagged eight more fish up here in Anchor Bay. And I have, I think. 10 or 15 more tags sitting on my shelf that I need to get out hopefully in the coming spring uh, up here in the day. But for the purpose of this, we're just going to focus on these three older groups that have the most information available. Again, there's like, you know, typically a 15 month lag. So the fish I tag up in Anchor Bay in the spring, I also deployed receivers just before that. So I haven't even downloaded that data. So I, I don't know anything about, you know, the initial. So here are our uh, results today. These are just a, a, a sum number of detections sort of summarized by a rough area. So the darker red the dot, the more detections there are. And these are individual detections. So every time that the receiver puts a chain in, it's reported. Um, and, and here. So what was really cool is we had one fish go to Buffalo, New York, and that fish actually came back. So. That's something that a, you know an old right. study that wasn't looking in Buffalo, New York, could have never decided. So it really speaks to like the utility and the power of a network like this. Um, but it's not surprisingly, most of our action is concentrated sort of where we release the fish. Um, so this I'm going to walk you through a couple of individual fish's behaviors, and what I'm going to show are dots that represent monthly average locations. So basically, I took all of its averages that long, all of the that long that I detected in that month, and just averaged them together and then plotted that average location on the map. So um, this fish was a 45 inch, 22 pound female. It was tagged in May 16. It was nine years old. Um, and then it was uh, released here uh, in Wyandotte uh, in May. You know, so the remaining five days, May, they they were close to where we released it. In June and July, started working her way down river. Um, August, September was further down river. October, starting to work her way back up river. November, spent the winter out in Lake St. Clair. <coughs> and then what was cool was that in the spring came back into the Detroit River, so April. And then in May 2017, was caught basically on top of where we initially caught it. And, and these fish were caught as part of the egg take, so. We were collecting them because they were in a spawning location at a spawning time. So, I'm not saying that that's what she was doing, but you know, that sort of intuitively makes sense. Um, this is uh, another fish 
Uh, these 007, so I'm nicknamed him James. He's a 39 uh, inch, 14 pound, eight year old male. You can see the map is expanded, expanded quite a bit here, so I'll show you his movement. Also tagged in May at Belle Isle. Uh, so stay, uh, stay pretty close for the remainder of that month. So by June at Orchard Way in Lake Erie. By July, has made his way most of the way across Lake Erie. In August, was up, uh, up in the Canadian side. And then in October, November, came back, spent the winter in Michigan waters of Lake Erie, and then he worked his way up the river as well. Uh, basically, also, he fought really close to where we captured him um, in the spring. And we continued to get the tension of this fish. He spent some time in Lake St. Clair over the summer. Um, and then, I don't think I show the dates here, but he, and he went back into Lake Erie uh, last fall as well. Um, so, this is sort of now uh, talking about all of the fish we tagged combined rather than the individuals. And what I'm showing you here on this graph is the, the, the center of the kind of cross is, is where we release the fish. As the rains increase, the, the distance from that starting location increases in kilometers. And then these points are just the average of all the fish tagged from that initial tag. So these are Thames River fish. We tagged them in October in the Thames River. Um, you see they kind of moved away. We're averaging between 20 and uh, 30 kilometers away from that tagging site during the spring and summer. Uh, but then towards the end of summer, they came right back towards the Thames River. And so what happens in the Thames River is we get a big fall run of gizzard shad, which is a popular prey fish. So this appears to be you know, a, a homing behavior, perhaps, to a, a prey source. So that, you know, shad run happens every year. That means that's something we must be to take advantage of. You know. Um, but it's, it's very neat in condition when we think of homing, we think of kind of spawning or salmon returning to their natal streams. So spawn and this is maybe showing a similar behavior but in response to a, a food source. Um, this is the same data from the Detroit River. So these fish are collected in May. Uh, move around and this fish is, this gets scrapped is influenced a lot by that fish that went to Buffalo. That's why <laughs> the distances are so much further. So that's important to keep in mind that. That's only been one fish that's shown that kind of movement, but um, so that's perhaps not typical. But uh, again, you know, the general trend is to move away from their capture location uh, after release, but then return to that capture location around the same time the following year. And so this is perhaps a, you know that homing to a spawning location. But we need to do more work to see if that these types of trends. A continue and B are, are you know related to one. <coughs> so this just sort of shows across all fish, um, excluding Mr. Uh, Mr. Bond that went to Buffalo. But uh, the, the number of detections, the number of fish uh, where they were they were captured by different times of year. So each each circle is an individual fish, and then the size of the circle is related to the number of detections. So fish that has a larger circle spent a lot of time in that area. And then here you see a bunch of circles that are overlapping. So that's basically one receiver that was protecting a whole bunch of our, our fish. Um, they were in that area in February of 2017. You see in June, they're responding to Detroit. Uh, a lot of fish are moving into the Detroit River being detected frequently, and they're being detected right where we're looking for them when, when uh, doing our egg take. So we you know spawning very. And then here in August, you see a big concentration of fish returning to that Thames River location. Probably or possibly in response to that shadow. Yeah, no. um, so, um, what we've seen is apparent widespread movement of fish tagged in the St. Clair Detroit River system. So, they're entering and leaving Lake St. Clair, they're entering and leaving the river. Um, and we're <coughs> starting to see patterns emerge. So, fish returning to the Thames River and fish returning to the location of the Detroit River. Um, so, kind of checking through some of these. Uh, we definitely are seeing movement patterns. Uh, we have this type of information, but it's not analyzed yet, so we expect to get that too. Um, we're definitely getting information on when and where they're spending time, and we hope to be able to, as we have more of these uh, release locations, uh, come online and get some data available, look at some of the potential population values. So, any questions? Yeah, question. I, I can see a correlation of a lot of things spend a lot of time. Sure. 
No, no, no idea. I mean, maybe following a, a food source or, yeah, I'm not sure what the, what yeah. drove that. Yeah, maybe he was lost. I don't know. He came back. Came back. Came back. Yeah. Yeah. Couple more. Yeah. Is, is this Lego's data available to the public? The individual data is not, but there, the website, <coughs> uh, which I think I put up there, um, you can go on there and there is sort of like a public facing stuff that will give you information to provide you context information um, for the different studies that are available. So like individual find movement data isn't, um, and there's also a limit on how far you can zoom in on the network and see like the precise locations of the receivers. So, um, <coughs> I mean, what, what, how do you hope to use this? I mean, it's kind of neat to see where the fish are moving, but is it a management tool or? Sure, we'd like to estimate the population size in Lake St. Clair, but you can't do that unless you know how the, the fish are structured. So you could just, you could just clip a bunch of fish and go out and recapture them later and do your traditional mark recapture. But if you don't know that a fish lives in that area where you clipped it, then you're probably, you know, committing some pretty major violations of the assumption. So, those types of models. So your estimates may have no, you know, bearing on reality, especially in a really big and open system where a fish, you know, a fish that tagged and they think there could go to Green Bay if they wanted. And then, and, you know, a mark recapture model would assume that fish is dead and it's no longer in Lake St. Clair, but maybe you're just looking for it at the wrong time of year. So definitely getting a sense of, uh, definitely getting a sense of uh, what the structure looks like. Um, yeah, I guess I didn't put it up there, but, uh, it's GLOS.us. So those are the, the management applications for it. And then better understanding um, where they are and when can help improve our, our, our current spawning, uh, our current like, musky rearing program by providing alternative locations to collect eggs. Um, that provides genetic diversity to our hatchery program and it also builds resilience into the system. So if something were to happen in the Detroit River where we couldn't get out there, there might be an alternative source where we can get eggs from. Instead of just saying there's not going to be any musky reared that that year. Have you ever tracked the uh, uh, one of those fish that have one of those really large uh, you know, distant uh, migration patterns? Have you ever tracked one that you see that same one? Not yet. <coughs> nope. I haven't heard that. It's just the one fish that did that large movement. And that fish moved back into Lake Erie but did not return to the buffalo. Or whatever. Do you or anyone else have been I haven't. Uh, it would be something interesting to, to work with. I, I mean, there would definitely be some, you know, the movement data of a fish might be a million data points. So there, there's definitely some some constraints on, on, on that. But, but that would be, I mean, that would be really cool to work with. I have worked really closely with angling. Um, so I don't know. Um, you know, we've worked really closely with uh, angler groups to provide the funding to buy tags. And, and they were really into doing like uh, adopt a fish where they could, you know, someone would would buy essentially buy a tag and I would let them name the fish and provide them movement data for that fish. So, yeah. They they all wanted to name the fish and have their ladies and they were fairly there's an underrepresentation of female fish in our data set right now. So I've been waiting to see which uh, which female fish we got and then we continue to decide to I was thinking the the same thing she was because I, I've done the year and one of the bear project before and one of the sixth grade and uh, this kind of apply the same idea and same kind of to uh, do a fish to be a great project. Yeah, that'd be really cool. I definitely would be open to it. I, I, I think that's something that would be open to it. But I have no idea what I mean. I've never done anything like that, so I don't know yeah. what to do. You know? <laughs> we were exploring it during the fishery commission, so we already piloted. Um, and eventually, it might fall to me to start developing a larger program, but nothing is done. So, I think all the time, I was broken, so I'm just a person now that wants to be interested in fish and be interested in more exciting than other fish. Right. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. Just kidding. Teachers, does that sound enticing? Yeah. Lots of fish? Okay. That's something that we haven't talked about. 
Are you personally available for a 45 minute presentation to the middle school class? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> that is the right answer to a class or a group of teachers. Yeah, no, I think so. Because like when I asked my kids, Rich, your hand if you've ever been on Lake Michigan, almost no me into love. When I say Lake St. Clair, I get half the class. And say, yeah, no, I, I get that from the class. Until it can come in at Dave's and Hines, but yeah.